Before I begin to talk about my experience as a parent of a child with a rare disease, I just wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the condition. Um, so, lymphangiomatosis is the name given to a rare, life-limiting, life-threatening, congenital, progressive, multi-system disorder of lymphatic channels. The disease can affect any organ, be une unevenly distributed in the body and progress at different areas at different rates. The cause of the disease is yet unknown, but may be due to a congenital areas of the lymphatic development occurring prior to the 20th week gestation. Trauma, onset of puberty and inflammation may play a role in the progression of the disease. Because of its slow course and often vague symptoms, the condition is frequently under-recognized or misdiagnosed, depending on the extent of the abnormal lymphatic channels and which areas are affected, symptoms can vary. And I want to mention at this time that although I'm here to talk about my experience as a parent of a child with lymphangiomatosis, our patient group also supports um, people affected by gorham stout disease or vanishing bone disease. So gorham stout disease is a very rare skeletal condition characterized by uncontrolled proliferation of distended, thin-walled vascular or lymphatic channels within the bone which leads to reabsorption and replacement of bones with angiomas or fibrosis. Because both lymphangiomatosis and Gorham's disease share some characteristics, with up to 75% of patients with lymphangiomatosis having bone involvement, um, this leads to some to conclude that lymphangiomatosis and Gorham's state disease should be considered as a spectrum of the disease rather than separate diseases. There is no standard approach to the treatment of lymphangiomatosis or Gorham's disease, and often the treatment is only aimed at reducing symptoms. So my son Alfie was born in 2007, weighing eight pounds, nine ounces. He seemed like any other child for the first few months of his life. And then one day, almost overnight, we noticed that his whole right leg was more swollen than the other one. We went through the usual channels of seeing our local GP, and then referrals were made to our local hospital in Aberdeen, where x-rays and MRIs were taken. The results of these showed some abnormalities, but it was still unclear what was wrong with him. And it was at this point that we were made, um, a referral was made to a specialist hospital in London. I was told not to worry, and it would probably be nothing. The appointment date for London eventually came and by this time, I was just wanting someone to tell me what was wrong with him and what they were going to do to make it better. So we travelled the 600 miles down to London and waited for the doctor to come and talk to us. The outcome of this appointment was about to change our lives forever. Alfie had a rare disease called lymphangiomatosis. The doctor told us that there was little known about the disease, there was no cure and very few treatment options available. We were told it would be best not to Google the disease because the information online might not be relevant to Alfie because of the wide spectrum of the disease and how each person was affected differently depending on where the disease was present. We asked if there were other families that we could talk to but was told that it would probably not benefit us because each child is affected differently. The doctor told us he would arrange a follow-up appointment for a year's time, but in the meantime, told us to go home and wait and see what happens. So it actually only took three appointments over the course of 18 months to get a diagnosis, um, which in the world of rare diseases is, is quite quick. After the year of not knowing what was wrong with him, I thought once we had a diagnosis, things would get better. But having the diagnosis only led to more questions and more uncertainty. What does this diagnosis mean for my son? What was, the dis was the disease going to spread to other parts of the body? What should we be looking out for? Of course, the first thing we did when we got home was we Googled the disease. And the literature told us that he probably wouldn't reach his fifth birthday. I felt totally powerless. How was I supposed to help my son if I didn't know what was happening to him? Nobody could tell me why or how this had happened. And there was no information or guidelines on how the disease would progress, 
No treatments were offered and no support was given. I felt very frightened and alone. On reflection, what happened next is quite terrifying and I feel quite ashamed of my ignorance and the fact that I didn't question things more. Alfie spent the next year floating around the healthcare system. We attended a few checkups at the local hospital, seeing a different doctor each time. We had a few routine blood tests done, but were never told the results. Over time, he started crying more, and when he became quite a miserable child. You know, was he just a grumpy baby, or was this part of the disease? I didn't know, I didn't have anyone to talk to. I remember on one occasion we ended up at an out of our surgery, or G-Docs, because I was worried about him. I thought I'd seen blood in these stools. On the second occasion we went to an accident and emergency, as his already larger leg um, was changing colour, like it was badly bruised. And I explained to the doctor he had this rare disease, and that we were seen at both our local hospital and also at a specialist hospital in London. You know, on both occasions, we were sent home with no reference to a follow-up with the hospital. I was just told to go home, and then if, if the symptoms persisted, or I was concerned, to make an appointment with my local doctor. On looking back, I can't believe I let this happen, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. I put my trust in the doctors. I was just a mum. I believe that the local hospital, the out of our surgeries, and the doctors at the accident and emergency all assumed that my son was being looked after by somebody else. That he was somebody else's responsibility. But in fact, it was just the opposite. No one doctor had taken responsibility for my son's care. He was floating about within the healthcare system, having not been allocated anyone to see, oversee his care after diagnosis. So the turning point came one Friday evening. Um, he developed a very large bruise on his arm. Um, he hadn't knocked it, he hadn't fallen, he was really grumpy and he was running at temperature. So again, I took him to an out of our surgery. It always seems to be at night that your child gets sick. Um, and I explained the situation to the doctor, the disease, what had been happening, mentioned that we were flying down to London on the Monday to see the doctor at the specialist hospital. Um, but I was worried because of the bruise and because of the, the temperature. The doctor told me to continue with paracetamol and because we were flying down to London on the Monday, not to worry about it because we would be seen then. So he sent us home. We arrived at the London hospital on the Monday. The doctor took one look at Alfie and we went from being an inpatient, uh, an outpatient, sorry, to being admitted. And within half an hour, he was hooked up to monitors and he was being given fluids, antibiotics, and blood products. He had a high temperature, he was pale, um, and his heart rate was dangerously high. His right leg was extremely swollen, purple in color, and hot to touch. So bloods were taken to find that his blood count was dangerously low, and he was a very sick little boy. Our two-day review at the London hospital turned into four weeks of hell. After a week, we were told to call the family because they didn't think that he would survive because he wasn't responding to treatment. And it was this point that they started to talk about um, introducing a course of vincristine, a type of chemotherapy, and steroids to see if this would stabilize his condition. So the tumors or cysts in Alfie's body are not cancerous, but back in 2010, vincristine was the only real treatment option available for this disease. So thankfully, after a few weeks, he started to respond to this line of treatment and his condition stabilised and eventually we were transferred back to our local hospital in Aberdeen. Things changed in relation to his care after he was started on chemotherapy. We were referred to the oncology team and a treatment plan was put in place. Suddenly the doctors listened and took my son's disease seriously. We were given a clinical nurse specialist as a point of contact. If I had any worries, I just had to get in touch. And we also had open access to the medical ward at our local hospital. So day or night, if Alfie was unwell, I just had to pick up the phone and I could take him in. Alfie's course of chemotherapy lasted two years. During this time, we were admitted at least once a month for four to five days at a time due to unexplained high temperatures and infections and problems with low platelets. 
We learned to always have a bag packed as the next admission was never far away. But having the support of the oncology team at this time was a godsend. The chemotherapy was never going to cure his disease, but we knew he would be able to take it for a short period and that would give us time to explore other treatment options. I feel very upset and angry that it had to get as bad as it did before someone took responsibility for my son's disease. His disease is not cancer, but the services and support that we were offered, or that is offered to patients with cancer is fantastic. And during this very difficult and uncertain time, this was exactly the type of care and support that we needed. In the last eight years, Alfie has spent a lot of time in and out of hospital. Routine appointments with oncology for checkups and treatment, cardiology to check his heart because of the side effects of some of the medication that he's on, gastroenterology because he has problems with his stomach, physiotherapy, orthotics and wheelchair services because he has mobility issues. We attend as an outpatient every four weeks to have bloods and his port flushed. And then there's the admissions for unexplained high temperatures and infections, the planned surgeries and the unexpected surgeries. Six monthly visits take us down to London Hospital, where we travel 600 miles to stay a few nights to be seen at the vascular clinic, leaving my eldest son at home with his gran. My husband having to take more time off work being self-employed means that while we are away, there is no money coming into the house. You know, time off work, it adds a financial burden to a already stressful situation. I myself have not been able to go back to work because of the excessive days of school life he has because he's unwell, accompanied by the number of hospital visits we have. My son tries to keep up with his friends and he wants to be just like everybody else but the disease has put restrictions on his life, his fragile bones, his poor mobility, the fatigue and pain that comes with the disease. I think he handles the disease far better than me, emotionally and physically. As a mother watching, as much as I tell myself to focus on what he can do and be positive, on the bad days it's all too easy to dwell on things that he's missing out on and things that he will never be able to do. Nobody prepares you for this. The stress it puts on you as a parent, on your relationship with your partner, the guilt you feel when your family life is disrupted again because of another hospital admission, and your other child has to go on yet another sleepover with family and friends. It took me a long time to come to terms with the diagnosis and what it meant to me as a family. At this point, I decided that something had to change. I felt totally overwhelmed by everything that was going on. And in order to help my son and me get through this, I had to gain back some control over what was happening. And I was so fed up of nobody being able to answer my questions. I was fed up of being told, let's wait and see what happens. And I was fed up of feeling helpless. It was a very hard lesson that I've learned, but by sharing my experience, I hope that I will be able to stop what I went through happening to other families. So in 2011, after things had settled down and Alfie's condition had stabilized, I founded the Alfie Milne Lymphangiomatosis Trust. I knew that the best way to help Alfie was by finding other patients and by funding research to help find better treatment options that will give him and others hope for their future and a better quality of life. So our board of trustees is made up of friends and friends of friends, and we hold our monthly meetings around my kitchen table. You know, these friends give up their time to attend meetings and fundraising events to help the charity achieve its goals. You know, I want to be able to provide information to help educate patients and their family members, provide general support to patients and their families, and to increase public awareness within the medical community, and also to raise money for vital research. We are the only patient organisation here in the UK, but work closely with our partners, the Lymphangiomatosis and Gorham's Disease Alliance in Europe and in the US, and the Lymphatic Malformations Institute also in the US. Working together means that patients and families, wherever they are in the world, have access to the same information and support. Patient groups like ours 
play an important role by raising awareness, providing information and resources for the public, patients and medical professionals. We are often the main and only source of information for newly diagnosed patients and their families. <coughs> when Alfie was diagnosed, we were told by the doctors that because the disease affected each child differently, it would not benefit us to speak to other families how wrong they were. <coughs> Through our online Facebook support group, we have found and talked to over 30 patients and their families here in the UK, a further 20 in Europe and over 200 in the US. Talking with other patients and families does help. Just knowing that you are not alone, having a place to share your experience with others that understands helps. Now, six years on, my experience allows me to help the newly diagnosed families that are struggling to come to terms with the diagnosis. We can give them access to information and direct them to doctors that have experience in our diseases. Educating patients and parents on the disease after diagnosis is crucial. Knowledge gives them the confidence to ask questions. Knowing the signs and symptoms of the disease can be the difference between life and death. Often the patient will become the expert, as some doctors will only ever see one case in their entire career. I want to mention at this point the struggles that our patient community face trying to find the right care. You know, due to the complexity of the disease, patients benefit greatly from a multidisciplinary approach. We are very lucky to have Great Ormond Street Hospital and their team of doctors to look after our children. But sadly, there are no specialist services here in the UK for our adults. Patients are often just seen at their local hospital and it is their symptoms that are treated rather than the disease. Because of this, we have patients travel as far as the US to have surgical procedures done, costing them personally hundreds and thousands of pounds because the procedure is not available here in the UK. And in the last month, we have arranged five adult patients to travel to Madrid to attend a vascular anomaly clinic at the La Paz Children's Hospital, um, organized by a Dr. Juan Carlos Lopez. The consultation itself is free but the patient still has to pay for their travel and accommodation to stay there. And we hope to be able to arrange more clinics like this in the future because there just isn't anything here in the UK for our adults. With our disease being so rare, I believe it is very important to work together with our European and international partners. Together we have a, patient a larger patient community to learn from, a larger network of doctors that we can approach for help and advice and collectively, we have more funds to dedicate to supporting patient projects and research. I believe we are very lucky to have a good working relationship with our partners and are very proud of our collaborative funding achievements. Together, we have funded international patient and family conferences, science and medical conferences, research at Great Ormond Street Hospital, Patient information is now available in six languages to help our non-English speaking families and have funded research through the University of Pennsylvania's Million Dollar Bike Ride Program. These achievements could not be possible if we hadn't been working together. I take every opportunity to raise awareness of my son's disease by getting involved in rare disease events, attending medical conferences, having articles in medical journals and magazines, which allows us to reach out to patients and network with the medical professionals. I'm very grateful to Find a Cure for giving me this opportunity today to share my experience. At the beginning of my journey, I felt like a very small fish in a very large pond, alone and frightened. But over time, by finding other patients and connecting with other groups and organizations, it has given me support and the courage to stand up and be heard. Because together we have a voice Together we are stronger and together we can achieve more. Thank you. <laughs>